All right. So uh, today I'm going to talk about how to design a map. Uh, yes, this is something that we use every day, but today I'm going to talk about some of the trade-offs uh, that we need to handle when we design a map. I'm going to start with a very level zero, very basic implementation, and then slowly build up on top of that as we encounter some of the problems in our design. And then finally, we'll uh, end up with looking at how does Go implement a map. And uh, I want this session to be very interactive, so feel free to stop me or ask me any question anytime. Okay, so let's start. Uh, first of all, uh, basics out of the way. What is a map? Map is a data structure which supports these operations. Yes, there are others, delete, iterate, other stuff, but uh, today we'll just focus on get and put. So you can um, get uh, the value for a given key and you can also uh, update or insert a key uh, along with the value. But the most important thing is that both of these operations should happen in O1 time. At least that's the idea. In uh, worst case, it can degrade. And this is where we'll see some of the trade-offs that, uh, that we, and that will come into play. Okay, so this is a very, put my screen away. Yeah, so this is a very uh, basic V0 implementation of a map. And that's uh, what we see in our textbooks. Okay. So here we have an array and uh, each array uh, element points to a linked list. And when we try to hash, when we try to insert a given key, so first we hash the key and then we map it to any of the index of the array. And then we finally insert that into the linked list. So if, if there's um, no uh, value here, we insert um, the head uh, node. And if a linked list already exists, we uh, add it to the end. Okay, but uh, we uh, immediately start to see some problems with this design. The main issue is that the size of the array is static, right? So it, it, either it's, it becomes too small or it becomes too large. So if, if it's too small, so let's say that we have uh, uh, an array of size five and we try to insert 100 elements, that means there's going to be a lot of collisions from, let's say, let's say they're like, uh, 50 elements get mapped to index two. So that means now you, if uh, uh, you need to get the value of a key and it maps to the index two, then you need to iterate the whole linked list for 50 elements, right? So that that uh, point about uh, keeping the complexity O1, that starts to uh, that starts to go away. And same, like if uh, we have a too large array and then actually we are inserting very few elements, then we have a wastage of space. So. Here's an idea. What if we grow maps dynamically, right? So let's say that we start with an, in any initial size of the array, and then we slowly start to grow it as and when we insert more elements. So this way, at least we have our space uh, concerns addressed, but still we have some unanswered questions. Number one is when do we grow this array? It, do we just grow when, uh, when let's say that the, the, uh, the length of the largest linked list uh, exceeds a certain size, or let's say that uh, the total number of values uh, exceed a certain size, or like what, what's the threshold here? And what's the algorithm here? And what is the overhead of that algorithm? Because every insert you need to run that and check that, oh, do I need to increase or do I need uh, to, should I keep the same size or, uh, and, and uh, how do I take that decision? And secondly, what is the ideal starting size, right? Do we start with 10, 100, or like, how do we do that? Okay, so let's uh, start with the first question. When do we grow? So usually in a, a map implementation, we have something called as the load factor. So load factor is the average number of elements per bucket. And the algorithm for triggering growth is just if n, it's the total number of elements, if n is greater than the array size into load factor, we trigger growth. So for example, if let's say that load factor is two and our array size is five, that means in an ideal case, in an ideal case, we'll assume that the 10 elements is the best case uh, uh, scenario for our map. 
So our threshold is five into two thread. So that means whenever we try to insert the eleventh element, will trigger an array group. Okay. Now let's look into the starting size. What should be our starting size? So if size is not set, we allocate lazily and double as we go. So this is uh, the case when we just uh, initialize with an empty map and then slowly start to insert elements. So uh, the size will go from uh, one, two, then four, eight. 16 on, so it will just double. And if the size is set, then uh, then we'll keep on bumping B until uh, load factor into B is greater than N and round it up to the next power of two. So for example, if load factor is 6.5 and we are trying to make a map of N elements, then we'll first try with B equal to one, then one into 6.5 is 6.5 and two into 6.5 is 13. That means B equal to two. So for, an, for a map of load factor 6.5, if we try to initialize with 10 elements, then the array will be two. Array will be of size two. So uh, 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 the important thing to note here is that the power of two, every, I mean, both of the cases, we see that the size of the array is always the power of two. Now, why is that? Advantage is, is that the array size, if, if uh, the size of the array, let's say that B, B is the size of the array, you can actually store that as a log of B. So that means now, uh, now keep in mind that like everything starts to matter here, right? I mean, when you are creating a map, now let's say that you need to store the size of elements of the map in a separate variable, right? Now, if you can store uh, set the size of the variable as an 8-bit integer instead of a 64-bit integer, that also starts to matter, right? So if we can just say that, oh, B is a power of 2, that means we can just store the log of the variable. That means now the variable which contains the array size can be an 8-bit integer, right? So all of that starts to matter. But most importantly, the indexing operation can be just a uh, bitwise and instead of a modulus operator. So here, where we were doing the hashing. So after hashing, we need to map the value to any array index, right? So usually, usually we would do a modulus uh, operation of the hash, but if we know that the B is a power of two, then we can just do a bitwise and, and a bitwise operation is much, much faster than an actual modulus operation. So for example, if B is four, then 100, zero, zero, which is the bitwise representation of four, 100 zero, zero minus one is zero, one, one. So we can see that the lower two bits will always remain within the range of zero to three. So you just hash and B minus one, get the index and then uh, go forward with our operations. Now, you might be asking the question like, what if I know the elements, to, uh, know all the elements that I need to be inserted, right? Essentially, like what if I have a static map? So here we were uh, kind of uh, limited to the next power of two. So for example, if we know that uh, we, we need to have a map of 33 elements, what we'll do, uh, what this, the V1 algorithm will do is that it will have a map of size 64 elements because the next power of 32 is 64. That's, that's just how it is. So, but then you might ask that, why do I need to pay for this cost, right? I know that I have 33 elements. Why do I need to have 64? Fine, like you, you can tell me that, oh, power of two is very good, but uh, my space, let's say that I have a scenario where space is a more bigger uh, concern for me than just uh, CPU time. So in that case, there's something called as a minimal perfect hash. So this is a different uh, category of hash maps where the, the use case is that it has to be always a static map. That is the number of elements in the map cannot change after the map is constructed. So there, there are several, several algorithms for that, but basically like if you need 33 elements, it will give you 33 elements and they're like custom algorithms which handle uh, which a uh, guarantee that there will be no collisions. Okay, so before I go on, uh, are there any questions? Okay, cool. So now we come to our V1 of uh, our map design. 
now we have a dynamically growing array, we are space efficient, we have an optimal starting size, everything is good. And this is actually very close to how most programming languages implement map. But now let's take a deeper look into this. Now we have a linked list here. Now, do we actually need a linked list? Not necessarily, right? As long as like this can be any data structure where, where you can just search for an element, it works. And that's actually true. So in Java 8, there's, there's actually like a threshold here, like if the number of elements in the linked list exceeds that threshold, this entire linked list is actually recomputed to a binary tree. So yeah, but uh, now uh, apart from a binary tree, you can also have an array, right? So uh, C++, the C++ map uses linked list. Now let's see the different trade-offs of a linked list versus an array, right? So linked list has terrible cache locality. Like there's a lot of pointer chasing going around, which creates tremendous pressure on the CPU cache. But on the flip side, you, the, the, the element of the linked list is actually addressable. So, uh, so in Go, if you try to do ampersand mk, it will just throw a compiler error. So that means like you cannot even take the address of the value of the map. So that's that's just something which the which uh, I mean the, that's just the design decision of how the Go programming language has decided to implement map, right? So our next idea is to use an array instead of the linked list. Okay, so now we come to the Go implementation of how it does a map. So there are no linked lists here. Essentially, a map is just a huge array. It's just a single chunk of memory. And inside, so this is like a, a single uh, bucket inside that array. And inside the bucket, you will have uh, the, the key and the values. So. Yes, we have array of buckets instead of linked list and each bucket is of size eight and the load factor is of size 6.5. Yes, and if uh, one bucket overflows, we'll have a separate overflow bucket, but yes, the objective is to not have overflow buckets at all. Okay, so now let's take a deeper look into how is a bucket, how does a bucket look like, looks like. So here we have, yes, so uh, a bucket has uh, eight elements. So we'll have eight keys and eight values. And there are also this eight top hashes. So like, what is this top hash thing? So let's look into that. So remember that the key, the key can be any comparable type, right? Key can be integers, keys can be strings, keys can even be byte slices, right? So when you are comparing, when you're trying to get the value of a given key, you need to compare that, okay, is this key equal to this or this or this? You need to make this comparison, right? So either you store the hash of the key and then compare with the hashes, but the hash will actually, hash also will take a size, right? Or if you don't store a hash, you need to compare with the actual key. And if the key is a byte slice, that will take a longer time, right? So what do we do? So here we take a compromise. We don't store the full hash, we just store the top eight bits of the hash. So that means we know that if the hash does not match, that means obviously it is not the key, right? Because the key has to match with the hash. But if the hash matches, then we need to again compare with the key. So this is like a quick elimination way of uh, trying to, uh, trying to uh, compute whether a given key is equal to uh, any of the keys here or not. Okay, so now you're asking that, okay, like I don't have byte slices in my uh, map as the key, I just have integer keys. So why do I need to have these top hashes? I can just compare a given key like X equal to Y and just go ahead, and go ahead with it, right? Why do I need top hashes? Yes, that is exactly right. So now we come into the nitty gritties of it. So essentially when you write MK, the runtime actually compiles it into any of these four variants. Now we can actually see that there are actually separate imp map implementations for key types of U in 64, U in 32 and string, and then you have a generic map implementation. So in your, uh, 
uh, map, if you have an integer key, in that scenario, there is no top hash. You'll just have a key. And if you have a string key, then there are like separate, like there's a separate algorithm which uh, checks if, if the size of the key is less than a threshold, then it goes to a separate custom algorithm. If it's greater than the threshold, it goes to a separate algorithm. And this is like a generic map. So now we can see that, yes, there are like separate implementations depending on the key of the map. And similarly, for the assignment uh, step also, we have these separate implementations. So now we can see that, okay, like there are trade-offs everywhere. Like, do you uh, want to have a static map then use many bulk perfect hash? Do you want your users to get the address of uh, the value, then you need to have a linked list. Or if you are okay with not allowing your users to get the value of the, uh, sorry, to get the address of the value, then you can use an array. Do you want to use a top hash or not? Do you want to store the hash uh, of, the, of the key? Or do you want to maintain the overhead of having multiple map implementations depending on your key, right? So all of these trade-offs start to come into play and uh, if you are uh, if you are a developer looking to uh, implement if looking to write high performance code then you need to keep in mind all of these different trade offs okay so now i'll just finish up with a, a code walkthrough of how does uh, go access a given uh, key uh, a given key of a map so this is all the code i'll just so, and this is just a, a stripped down version of this code. I'll just give a quick walkthrough of it. So here, there's the first step. We take the hash of the value. So we are here. Then we compute the mask. Mask is the, the basically the size of the, so remember h dot b is the logarithm, right? So you need to do a bit shift to actually get the size of b. And then we do this bitwise add, and this is just pointed arithmetic to get to the particular uh, index of the array. And then we compute the top hash. And then, so this for loop, this is just expanded here. Now I'm just running through the for loop here. Okay, so now we have reached our index of the bucket. Now, okay, here, now here we just compare the top hash value with the first index here. Okay, it's not equal to, we move again. Now we go to the next index, again compare the top hash. Okay, it's not equal to, move again. And now it's a third comparison. Okay, so now it's equal to. Now it's, since it's equal to, now we actually need to compare whether the key is equal to the given input or not, right? So again, some pointed arithmetic to move to the key. Basically we are just, here, and then we do this if key is equal, okay, not equal. Again, we go ahead here, we check the next top hash, okay, it's equal. Again, we go with the key. Again, we make the comparison. Now it's equal. So once it's equal, again, we need to go to the value, right? So again, some pointer arithmetic to point to the value here, we get the value and that's it. Okay, so lastly, let me just recap. We started with a fixed array size, and then we moved on to a design with a dynamically growable array because we need to maintain the, the size complexity also. And then we decided what should be our optimal starting size. And then we uh, noticed that linked lists have uh, some considerable uh, CPU performance penalties. So we switched to arrays instead of linked lists. And then we decided to use top hash for quick compare, keeping the fast implementations for integers and strings. And that's it. <laughs>